So namaste and welcome my friends. It's a It said that when Adam and Eve left Eden, he commented to her, he said, my dear, we are living in a time of great transition. And have you noticed that it always feels like that, that in some, time, some way that the times we're in are uniquely intense and fast paced and stressful, uh, even knowing that, historians will probably look back at 2020 with raised eyebrows. Um, I just saw a cartoon a friend sent me of a woman. She's telling her partner, my desire to be well informed is currently at odds with my desire to stay sane. And I think we understand, um, given our off the charts combo of current stressors, it's easy to feel like we're waiting for the bad stuff to go away. You know, there's, we're kind of waiting to resume real life. But actually, and there's, there's a deep understanding in this, that if we're waiting, if we're waiting for something different, we won't bring a full, honest presence to what's actually arising right here and now in our path. And it's only by doing that that we really wake up. And for many of us, what's arising on our path, what's really asking for attention is anxiety. So this evening, I'd like to reflect together on how we can transform our relationship with anxiety, how we can arouse the presence that brings inner freedom and its outer expression, what many people call love in action. So as mentioned in the opening, uh, for the first time in this weekly online class, we'll be including some time for questions at the end. So I wanna remind you that if you're on Zoom and you have a question during the talk, uh, please write it in via the chat box to everyone and submit your question just once. Um, yeah, so feel free. Anxiety and fear has been spiking over the last six months. It was already epidemic levels anyway uh, around the world, but you know the converging streams. I mean, we do. We know that between the pandemic and unemployment, I'm aware that just this week, tens of millions of people are facing eviction due to unemployment. The, the streams of, of our children's schooling and this growing awareness uh, that's so profound around the globe of race-based injustice and violence. And then the trauma, just these last two weeks of wildfires, about three days ago, one of my friend's home burned down, uh, hurricanes. I mean, unless we're in denial, it'll keep coming. This is the crisis of our earth. So I've mentioned, uh, on Saturdays, I do this live satsang, this hour where people ask questions. And we really, we explore how meditation can help with all the different challenges. And of course, you're all invited. So um, feel free to sign up on my homepage of my website. What I wanted to share is how a good number have named the way that their past trauma is now being activated by current stressors and how much is just driving them into a sense of real isolation and depression and fear and anxiety. And of course, another stream for many in the United States is a kind of gripping fear around upcoming elections. Um, for many, the sense that so much is at stake for generations to come, for those who are most vulnerable, um, for democracy, for our earth. So as we'll explore tonight, if we want to heal and if we want to evolve, and I'm talking about individually and as a species, it all depends on how we respond to the anxiety and fear that's arising so strongly. Because here's what happens. Unprocessed fear gives rise to violence and to more separation. 
And this is true in our individual life to the degree we have fears that we really have not attended to with mindfulness, with kindness, it ends up separating us from others. And it's true as a society and it takes the shape of war and all sorts of other forms of violence. So if we want to create a more loving, peaceful world, and I feel like we're here because we want to, we need to let attention to anxiety be at the center of our path. It's not like we're waiting for things to change. It's like, this is what's arising that's asking for our attention. And if we don't pay attention, uh, our primitive brains will rule the day. So in Buddhism, this intention to bring presence to difficulty, to let the difficulty actually wake up our compassion, wake up love in action, is described as the bodhisattva aspiration. And I love it because it's such a powerful expression of really, I think, what we all long for when we're most awake, that that whatever comes our way, that it helps us to deepen our love. And bodhisattva means awakening being. And I thought maybe we'd do a brief inquiry here just to explore the power of this. And you might pause and um, close your eyes for a moment. And as you're listening, and as you've been listening, you might just sense from what we've been already exploring, how the stress of these times is landing for you. How whatever you're experiencing in your personal life or experiencing and witnessing in our society, how it might be bringing up distress or anxiety or fear for you. What's triggering anxiety for you? What's the situations that's most, uh, most challenging, most evocative? And again, it could be in your personal life or it could be societal. And take a moment to let that be in close. Whatever's bringing up distress. And then calling on your inner bodhisattva, the most awake part of you. Just feel, feel this aspiration, this wish. May I meet this distress with presence. May it awaken wisdom and compassion. May it give rise to love in action. And feel free to totally alter the words so they fit you. But that sentiment, that what's arising, may it serve awakening of heart and mind. And you might, as you do this, Take a moment to imagine what might these times bring forward in you? What might they awaken? More fearlessness? Resilience? Capacity for presence? For love? More trust in yourself? More ability to help and serve? What do you imagine and wish that the difficulties might bring forth. And feel free to take a few full breaths if you'd like to open your eyes or keep them closed if you'd prefer. I wanted us to reflect on this 
bodhisattva aspiration because I've seen over and over that while great stress quite naturally uh, triggers off our distress and fear, if we consciously are dedicated to bringing presence to it, it can awaken our potential heart, you know, really an awake, alive heart and awareness. And I often think of uh, Vietnamese Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh and how he described the refugees on boats seeking safety in the midst of violent storms and, you know, being attacked by pirates and so on. And he would describe how if just one person on those boats could find that inner place of calm and strength, in other words, step out of a reactive trance, they could help all the others on the boat find their way to safety. Love in action. And then he ends his teaching saying, please be that person. So my friends, this is the hope that instead of us waiting for it to be over, that we consciously dedicate to letting this be our path. This is our spiritual path, learning to calm ourselves in the midst of the storm and in the most deep way, bringing our presence to the anxiety and fear. It, it takes courage, but bringing it to the anxiety and fear with, with kindness, with compassion. Now, the starting place for this is actually recognizing when we go into a reactive trance. Um, if you have some mindfulness that you have gotten triggered and gone off into a trance reaction, then that mindfulness helps to loosen the identification with the reaction and helps you open back up into your wholeness more quickly. So just to clarify terms, what I'm calling a reactive trance is really when we lock into one of the three ways our primitive brain tries to control life, fight, flight, freeze. And it takes over our feelings and thoughts and behaviors. And when it does, in a deep way, we forget who we are. We are identified with a very limited, separate, threatened self. That's when fight, flight, freeze takes over. And it's helpful to remember that every one of us is conditioned to initially react to acute stress or threat with fight, flight, freeze. It's our older, faster brain, you know. And here's what's important. The suffering is not because this reaction happens. It's universal wiring. It's that we get lost in it it proliferates, it locks into place. Now, most of you know about fight, flight, freeze. This isn't new. But when we're caught in it, we often don't have the mindfulness to pause and go, oh, okay, that's my primitive survival brain taking over. Let's see how I can find my pathway back to presence. We just don't usually have the presence of mind to do that. So it's really valuable to examine when we're going into trance and get familiar with it so we actually have some more choices. So to that end, we're going to do a very brief review of fight, flight, freeze. And as you know, when it comes in the form of fight or aggression, um, it's very, very familiar what happens in our body. Uh, a, a teacher was discussing the Ten Commandments with five and six year olds. And after explaining, honor thy father and mother, she asked them, what commandments teach about treating how you treat your brothers and your sisters? And one little boy who's the oldest in a family said, thou shalt not kill. And so for us, while we might not be physically violent, many of us aren't, most of us, when we feel threatened, we go into fight in the, and the version of fight is through our judgments, through our anger, through our hatred. And it's towards those we don't agree with, those who aren't cooperating with us, those who have hurt us, those we perceive hurting others. But that's fight. And it's no surprise that the current pandemic and uh, global stressors are straining relationships. A lot of people are going into fight mode 
at home sequestered with each other. And there was a um, article in the New York Times last week and the headline and the title was, I don't know if my relationship will survive the pandemic. Re it, it's part of what's motivated me to do a whole course on loving relationships, which you can find on the homepage of my website, but we go into fight and it's causing a lot of pain in our relationships. So that's one mode. And it comes a lot in the form of judgment. That's when you find yourself in chronic judgment, watch out. It also comes out passive aggressively. Um, some of us hold it in, it comes out sideways. There's that story about a woman who approaches her psychology professor and says, well, what's a Freudian slip? And he's curious. So he says, well, what makes you ask? She says, well, the other day I was having lunch with my mother and I meant to ask her to pass the salt. But instead I said, you damn bitch, you ruined my life. <laughs> so you get the idea. It does come out sideways. And then as we know, this is the last piece I'll mention on fight, the greatest target of our aggression is ourselves. Um, we are persistently uh, deeply critical and under that is shame and that's a huge suffering. So when we get locked in reactive trance and fight is dominating, we just find we're chronically angry, chronically critical. And the identity, our sense of identity is as a judging, aggressive, angry person. Okay go to flight. If we're not lashing out, then when we get threatened and anxious, uh, flight looks defensive. We're withdrawing. We're sleeping a lot. We're using substances to numb. We're trying to avoid pain and immerse in work. We're immersing online to avoid being here. I saw a cartoon with a man lost in a desert, and there's this sign. It says, water this way, and then internet this way, and you know which direction you was crawling in, right? <laughs> so you can't underestimate how much we flee reality through our devices. The primary mode of flight is obsessive thinking. So if you're tracking your own trances, look for judgment when it comes to fighting and obsessive thinking when it comes to fleeing. Those are the most prominent. The third, which is freeze, happens especially when there's been trauma. And with freeze, it's, it, there's, it's a sense of unreality as if we're watching from a removed place. It, life is surreal. There can be a sense of uh, cold or numbness or trapped in the body or the brain not working, can't make decisions, can't act, confused, um, helpless. So those are some of the signs of freeze. But I wanna name the common denominators that go through all of them, because this is what I think you're gonna find most useful. One is when you're in a reactive trance, you're dissociated from being in your body in any full awake way. Another is you're at those moments not able to feel your feelings directly, mindfully. At those times, there's no real access to compassion. And at those times, the identity is with a small, limited, threatened self. And as I mentioned, from the perspective of neuroscience, when you're in that trance, you're operating from just a small part of your being, from the primitive survival brain, the reptilian and limbic brains, and you're cut off from the whole, from the, an integrated brain that has all parts talking to each other. You're just living in a small part of your being. Okay, so I wanna pause here and invite you to reflect again. You've been listening, so let's, let's ground it in our own experience. And you might close your eyes and take a few full breaths. And let your intention be to, with curiosity and kindness, 
See if you can witness your own survival brain a little. And again, you might bring up a, a recent time you felt distressed. You felt reactive. And take a moment once you've got something in mind to actually connect with the experience. Uh, See where you were. Remind yourself what was triggering you. Get the felt sense in your body of what it was like. And yet still witnessing. So you can become familiar with that collection that we call your limbic reaction, your survival brain's reaction. And you might notice what kind of thoughts were circling around. Were they judging thoughts, blaming thoughts, worry thoughts like danger ahead? Was there kind of an obsessing? What are the emotions that you're aware of feeling when you're in that reaction? Helpless, angry, fearful, ashamed? What's the behavior? Yeah, to describe the kind of primitive brain inspired behavior? Is it fighting? Are you in some way lashing out? Is it flight, avoiding in some way? Freeze? And now here's where to get much more familiar is so helpful. What's your sense of yourself when you're in that reactive trance? You had a sense your identity. Do you feel like a victim, a perpetrator in some way, an aggressor? Are you aware of a real separateness? Limitation, falling short, failing? Or do you feel superior? Just get, sense the the template. This is how the self is experienced in trance. And notice, do you like this self? And we'll loop back to this because many find that when they're in a limbic trance and fight, flight, freeze, Part of it is that they don't like their fight, flight, freeze self, which of course is another layer of fight and it intensifies the activity of the survival brain. Okay, now you might shift your posture, sit up a little bit more, take a few full breaths, come back, come back. And we're gonna explore together now how training our attention can shift our relationship with anxiety, can really bring a liberating relationship with anxiety, can let anxiety become a portal, as the Bodhisattva aspiration describes, a portal for awakening. Now, the first um, understanding I find really valuable in working with anxiety uh, comes from a term coined by Dan Siegel, window of tolerance. When anxiety or fear arises, if you're inside the window, that means you're having that reactivity, but you're not so hyper aroused that it's unbearable, or you're not so hypo aroused and freeze that you're completely um, disconnected and everything feels unreal. You're inside the window, it's tolerable. So the first step in working with, with, anxiety and with fear is to make sure you're inside the window. You might have to get in the window. And many of us, um, even if we haven't experienced 
huge trauma in our life, get tripped off in a way that we first need to do some calming before we can go into step two, which is the full presence with. Think of it that way. It's helpful that the first step is often calming some. Or we have to calm our sympathetic nervous system to get inside the window. And then we start practicing being with the anxiety in a liberating way. So let's say you're outside the window. How do you calm yourself down? And I'm, I'm only going to do this as a brief review. If you want to do a deeper dive into the different tools for calming the nervous system, uh, you can check my website, uh, check on the, on the homepage for fear trauma, and you'll also find in my references, I have a number of fantastic books on uh, trauma and on um, trauma-sensitive mindfulness. So, but I'll name a few of the common ways of, of calming ourselves down. And one is, ob is the most obvious is just more generally, avoid the triggers that are going to set you off. I mentioned uh, at the beginning, the cartoon of the woman reading the news. For most of us, I think it's intelligent to limit our intake. Be careful. But let's say once we're triggered, how do we get in the window? And one way is the use of the breath. There's uh, a kind of breathing that is long and slow where we perhaps count to four or five on the in-breath, four or five on the out-breath, that over a few minutes can begin to calm us down. And there are a number of varieties on that counting. So that's a whole world unto itself. But just to know the breathing, when regulated, can bring you inside the window, can help. Then there's grounding, which is feel gravity, feel your belonging to the earth, feel your feet on the ground, feel the weight of your body. Uh, look around and see what's around you. Touch objects around you. In other words, get yourself here concretely. Notice the space around you, the space behind you, in front of you, to either side. And you can even say out loud some of the things you notice that are around you in the room or outside. And that helps to bring you here now, not what trauma does, which is it it actually catapults you into another time and space when danger was truly imminent or felt that way. Another way is to put your hand on your heart or on your belly, but touch is known to that warmth against that nexus of nerves is, is known to help calm the sympathetic nervous system. Move, walk, stretch, free movement, vigorous movement, it can help. The last thing I'll name is resourcing. And resourcing means any recollection of an image or use of words that help to evoke some sense of safety, love, or belonging. This is actually part of the N or the nurturing of RAIN, that you start finding a pathway back into safety, maybe an image of a loved one, uh, imagine hug, Imagine a safe space for you, an image of trees or ocean or your bedroom. Maybe there's words, some phrase of comfort, like you're not alone, or others feel this too, or I'm okay. Um, saw a cartoon of a great white shark with a huge gaping mouth, and he's shouting after this person who's frantically swimming away, saying, come back, come back. I just need a hug. <laughs> and I'm sharing that because each summer I swim in great white territory. And um, for some reason, that image actually helps me. So it's a resourceful image. <laughs> but it's probably uh, put aside for most of you who are listening. So OK, that is phase one, get inside the window. We're going to spend the rest of our time on part two, which is how to actually bring a courageous presence directly to anxiety. And you might keep in mind that when we feel fear and anxiety, it means we're at an edge. There's something we're unwilling to feel that's unfamiliar or threatening or raw. So this is exactly the place where if we deepen attention, uh, there's potential for awakening and healing. 
So we'll review the key steps that transform anxiety. And uh, as you might be hearing, as we're sitting here right now, it's starting to rain. And this is going to be um, a bit of a review of rain applied to anxiety. So the timing is perfect. I hope you enjoy the gentle sound of rain on the roof. <laughs> OK, the beginning uh, is really setting, setting the attitude or aspiration. And I find that whenever I'm going to be working with something difficult, there's some part of me that is um, calling on that bodhisattva aspiration, please may this serve awakening. It really helps. The acronym RAIN, for those that aren't familiar, recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And with the recognize and allow, what we're doing is we're just naming, oh, anxiety, our fear is here. And as they say, the shaman put it this way, that if you can name a fear, it starts to lose its power. So even just with the recognize of rain, just noting or naming what's there, actually begins to open your quality of presence to a wider field. And so the anxiety is there, but you're not as stuck inside it. So that's the first step, is just to name what you're aware of. And then the allow. And the allow is a really interesting moment. Because allow doesn't mean you're liking it or that you want it to continue. All it means is you're, saying, you're acknowledging the reality that it's here. You're saying instead of resisting or fighting, I'm going to allow this reality to be what it is. And I'm finding for many people, and you might find this helpful, just simply the words, this belongs. Um, just like a wave belongs in the ocean. This belongs, opens up more space, gives us more um, presence and capacity to be with what's there. And to keep in mind that with fear, fear is emotionally intelligent. It's, it's got a reason for being there. If we didn't have fear, we'd be brain dead. So um, we, we want to offer presence. We just don't want to be dominated by it. So that's recognize and allow. Let it be there. Then with the eye of rain, investigate. This is where we make the all-important shift from mental, uh, all that mental spinning of reactivity that we usually get in around anxiety to a more embodied presence. The key to investigate is to come into the body and feel the feelings. That is the key. Now there are some questions you can ask as part of investigation that might have some mental components. You might ask, well, what am I believing right now? I mean, I have found for myself that whenever I'm suffering, in some way I'm believing that I'm going to fail and there's some fear of failure, that that's a major belief there. So it's useful to identify that. Now, many people then stay in the mental realm, but what's important is to keep coming back and sensing, well, where does that belief live in my body? Feel it in the body. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, but I can't feel much in my body. And it's really true that for those especially that have been traumatized, um, there's a lot of dissociation. So it's a gradual process. And by the way, body scans help to, to get us more embodied. But to know this, you can trust this, that when you investigate, even asking questions like, where am I feeling this? And what am I feeling? And what does this fear need? will actually start waking up the experience and the intimacy with the fear. It brings more presence. And then there's the end of rain, which is nurture, which is active compassion. One evolutionary psychologist said, it's not the survival of the fittest, it's the survival of the nurtured. So we need to self-nurture. For one woman who is anxious about finances, and uh, just a few weeks ago talking to her about her children at home and 
trying to work out how to keep a certain amount of hours of work and it was just getting very, very tense. Uh, her way of nurturing was to say to the fear, thank you for trying to protect me. I'm okay right now. And it really helped to communicate that to her anxiety. Any gesture of care is part of nurturing. And then after those four steps, we move to after the rain. And I want to encourage you not to skip after the rain. This is where we become aware of the presence that has emerged and uh, an enlarged sense of being. And by paying attention to the shift from where we started, which is often a victimized self or an angry self, to a more spacious presence, by noticing that, this is, here's some neuroscience, we actually integrate the neural wiring that correlates to uh, that more whole state of being. By noticing it, what we're paying attention to, it actually helps it to integrate. So it moves from state to trait. A reminder now, we're gonna, I'm going to share a story of how this works and then we're going to practice, but a reminder is if in the process of doing RAIN at any time you feel overwhelmed, then go, oh, okay, outside the window of tolerance, back to some of the calming techniques and calm yourself, nurture yourself, and then you can re-enter the RAIN process. Okay, my friends, a story and then uh, let's, and then we'll practice together. I'm trying to keep my eye on the timing because I want us to have uh, time for questions. Uh, this is uh, one friend who was feeling enormous tension circling around the upcoming elections in the United States. He was filled with anxiety uh, approaching November. And so he was practicing RAIN. We practiced together. And the R is recognize anxiety, just naming it, and then allowing, letting it be there. And for him, his way of allowing was for him to say, this is part of being human, just to feel stirred up right now. Then he began to investigate. And he asked himself, well, what am I believing? And the belief was that there's just going to be more and more suffering, just huge, huge suffering to add on to what's already here. And he suffering for his people. This is a person of color and all people. And then when he said, okay, now I'm believing that, what is my body feeling? He was feeling alarm in his body, outright alarm. And again, he had to say, this belongs, this belongs. There's intelligence to the nervous system feeling alarmed. Uh, and then he just kept paying attention. And then he got in touch with powerlessness, that he was powerless to protect vulnerable people from suffering. And his mind went off to uh, his grandchildren and next generation. And then that deepened the sense in his gut of a kind of clutch and an alarm. And so again, with investigate, the process is you feel what's there and you let it be there. And sometimes it unlayers itself. And when he let that, that alarm and that clutch be there, what unlayered was a sense of grieving, a sense of of loss, a sense of, of deep, deep sorrow about, about the suffering and about uh, how many are, are destined to suffer even more. And that put him in touch with his caring. And once he could feel that, once he went through those layers, nurturing came naturally. He described it that he felt this kind of sacred light of his own soul holding that, that grieving, caring place, kind of surrounding him and filling him. And during after the rain, he really was resting, he said, in divine presence in his own soul. And he said that the stream of anxiety was still there, but it just was part of a much bigger mix. And he heard his own kind of voice of wisdom saying to him, you can't control but you can care and you can act. I was very touched by that. You can't control, but you can care and you can act. 
And for him, you know, he's he's very involved in terms of getting out the vote, but also very involved in his community. He's a helper in his community. I share this with you because so many are filled with apprehension and alarm right now. And it's crucial that we let it be a portal to help us connect with that kind of presence and equanimity and heart so that we can then act from love uh, and act from love in our close relationships, you know, pausing more to express appreciation, to smile, to listen, to care, and act as uh, part, is a part of a larger society that cares about widening circles of people. Because I found in my own life, and I find this again and again, that when I'm acting from care, it reduces anxiety. <laughs> it really does. So let's practice a little right now, and then I want to open it to questions. And take a moment again, as we have, this has been the last time to close your eyes and bring the attention inward. And take a few full breaths and collect yourself with your breath. And again, I invite you to bring to mind a situation in your personal life or in the larger society that triggers a sense of anxiety or distress. a situation that you know in some way triggers that kind of reactive trance we've been looking at where you get made smaller because of judgment or obsession, lashing out or turning on yourself, addictive numbing. So bringing to mind a situation that's distressing and take a moment and let's, again, draw on that bodhisattva aspiration. Feel your sincerity. May this distress, this anxiety or fear, may it serve to awaken compassion, wisdom, and love in action. Now let yourself bring that situation to mind in a close-in way. And so you can just practice a little shifting your relationship with anxiety, bringing it close in, sensing what's most disturbing about it. And the R of range is just to whisper whatever you're aware of that's most predominant. Anxiety, fear, anger, whatever it is. And the A of rain, let it be there, allow it. Just, you might say this belongs, this is universal wiring to feel what I'm feeling. It's part of being human, it belongs. Others feel this too. and then investigating. And you might ask that question, well, what am I believing? What's the, what's the fear belief? It may be personal that I'm, I'm failing, I'm unworthy, I'm not lovable, or it might be in a larger realm of society that the belief is there's gonna be a huge amount more suffering, something's gonna go really, really wrong. Whatever you're believing, feel where it lives in your body. 
And this is where the courage comes to feel your throat, your chest, your belly. And just breathe and feel a willingness to touch the sensations, the felt sense of anxiety or fear where it lives in you. You might place your hand on your heart, keep accompanying whatever's here. You might even explore letting your posture express the emotion and your face, and that'll help you get in touch with it. And see if you can feel right into the epicenter of that vulnerability, offering it a very gentle presence. And you might sense what is needed to heal. What does this place most need? Does it need feeling safe, feeling held, feeling loved? Accompanied, allowed, accepted. As you ask that question, see if you can listen from your highest self, from your bodhisattva self, from your awakened heart, and begin to offer whatever is needed to the vulnerability and anxiety. It may be like the man I described that you sense a light and a warmth just pouring in and surrounding it. A loving energy bathing it. The key is to let in nurturing. Let that anxious, fearful place feel held in something larger, like a wave held by the ocean. And you might send a message to that place. Whatever will be most healing, you're not alone. I'm here with you, I'm not leaving. You're held in love. And if it helps, you might bring to mind a nurturing person, a wise, kind person, or a deity, or part of nature, or a pet, and just imagine that energy flowing through too. Because the truth is the anxiety, the vulnerable place is a wave in a larger ocean. There is a larger and loving presence that's here. And letting yourself rest in that presence now, become aware of the quality of presence that's here, the quality of heart, the quality of awareness. And sensing whatever shift has happened, small or large, from more of that survival brain, fear, anxiety, to this increased presence, to the truth of who you are. And perhaps as you're ready, you can sense from this, this space of presence uh, what the different possibilities are for you in terms of love in action that resonate. Maybe in an immediate way with someone who you'll next see, the kindness that could be expressed and in larger ways in our society. And you might imagine others here around the world also bravely facing and processing and awakening through anxiety and fear, opening to a field of caring, to a shared field. 
and sense the power of that. My friends, thank you so much for being part of this. Our closing ritual, if you will, to be on gallery views to see each other. And um, I always say that, you know, you, nobody knows that you're looking at them, but it's a chance to look at others and actually feel your heart and feel your heart sending care. It's so beautiful to gather in this way. So just send it and let it in scroll through if you, if you kind of so you can see others stays and blessings thank you much love you thank you tara deborah wilbur i see you everybody everybody i'm gonna stay too